Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. My name is Gabe. My name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. But first, I have a question. Jeff. Yeah. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Um, should we say that we are recording this on Thanksgiving? <laughs> yes, we should. Yeah. So so today is Thanksgiving. Yeah. Uh, it is November 26th. We're recording this a couple days later than we normally would have. Also, we took last week off, so it feels like it's been forever, you know, forever <laughs> since we last recorded. Yeah. Um. But yeah, yeah, Thanksgiving. So um, even though this will not be coming out on Thanksgiving, expect a lot of Thanksgiving references in this episode, I guess. Sure, yeah. So uh, a couple days ago was my birthday. Mm-hmm. I- insert party noise <laughs> here. It's just, like um, one of those just like very lonely and sad <laughs> You know, like I a guess. noisemaker. Yeah, but of course, because of because uh, of COVID and everything, you know, it didn't really ha- didn't really do anything. We have a friend visiting from out of town. Uh, he took a COVID test before he came up here, and uh, and so he's just been staying with us for the week. Sure. So you know, it's been cool to have him around. But uh, but other than that, it's, it's been a pretty lame few weeks, I guess. Right. Yeah. Like relatively fine, but you know, yeah. but ultimately lame <laughs> right it's, it's, you know, i mean it's kind of how a lot of people are doing right now it's like relatively i'm okay sure but sure. ultimately it sucks <laughs> <laughs> everything's the worst but you know it's yeah. fine skylar made a, a delicious meal uh yeah and um i'm gonna be making some some uh fancy dessert i'm gonna be making like a it's like a it's like a cheat way to make a cheesecake okay uh it involves burning it <laughs> Oh, yeah. It's because it, like cheesecake, you're supposed to go like slow, slow and low, you know, pretty much. Yeah. And there's like a like, you know, somebody suggested doing like a water bath thing and all this other stuff. And it's, and then mm-hmm. I found like this recipe that's like, no, you just do it fast and hot and burn it. And it's it's basically <laughs> you you make a custard instead of like a normal cheesecake. Uh, OK, batter. OK. And then you, you you're caramelizing the outside of it, which basically becomes its own crust. Yeah. So, so instead of making a crust, you just you just make this like cheese, like cream cheese, like custard, you know, filling, sure. throw it in a pan and throw it in the oven really hot. And then it just kind of caramelizes and burns the edges. And you and then you just let it cool and you eat it. Yeah. I mean, hey, like a lot of things in cooking, there's there's so many different ways to do things that, yeah. you know, if, as long as as long as it works, right. it works, you know. Now I will be trying to do an an, uh, an actual cheesecake on Skylar's sure. birthday because she loves ke- cheesecakes. But I wanted to I wanted to at least try this like little ch- trick, little cheat way. Okay. See how see how yeah, it turned cool. out. Uh, so d- d- is it finished? Did it turn out good? No, it has. Well, no, I haven't. I haven't. I haven't finished it. I haven't done it yet. Okay. But but gotcha. I mean the good the, the upside of it is like I can I you know it only takes it takes like an it's like an hour in the oven, mm-hmm. and then you just you just gotta let it cool. But that's about it. Like there's really sure. not much. Does not take much to do. Yeah, that's cool. Um, one thing I probably should mention, um, I'm watching my, my waveforms here. I'm on a new, I built a new computer over mm-hmm. the last uh, couple of weeks and I feel like some of my audacity settings are a little bit different. I, I feel like I see my, my voice spiking more than it used to. I even turned down my, uh, the gain on my microphone a little bit. And we, we recently did our, um, the horror game that we meant to do for October came out this month in November and, uh, I, I had just finished my PC at, during that. And there were times in that where I noticed that my voice was spiking way more than it should have. So huh. if this episode's audio quality is a little bit different, I apologize. Yeah. I will be trying to get that sorted out as soon as possible. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's, that's the thing when like, there's a lot of like settings and stuff that you take for granted that when you switch to a new machine, you're like, wait a minute, this all that, that's just not the default settings. Crap. Yeah. So yeah, it'll, it'll take some, it'll take some adjusting, but I'm sure it's sure. I'm sure it's still it'll be fine. Yeah. And then um one more thing before we get into the actual episode, I uh in our last episode, which again came out a couple weeks before this one, I put a little thing at the beginning of the episode because I had an idea for something that I want to do at the end of the year. So like the very last either the very last week of this year or the first week of next year because our our anniversary of the podcast is technically going to be the second week of January because we our first episode was like January 10th or something. Um, so we're, we're going to have one more episode that is not a normal standard numbered episode. And what I want to do is I want to do a listener submissions episode. Like I said, I did put a little record, a little, uh, little disclaimer at the beginning of the, our last normal episode about this, but 
I haven't gotten any submissions yet. So, so, so maybe some people didn't, didn't quite get the, the message. So I want listeners to send in stuff they want to put into this listener submissions episode. If you, if you have a microphone, even if it's not a great microphone, right? record yourself, send something in. You want to tell us about a character that you had. Tell us about a campaign you were in. Tell us about an idea you had for something cool that D&D could do in the future. Tell us something you like about the podcast. Tell us something you wish we'd improve about the podcast. Tell us about anything that you think might be, might be, be related to the podcast in any way. We would love to put you in on this listener submissions episode we want to do at the end of the year. So get that into us. I think I said the deadline was Christmas. So either the episode that comes out just a few days after Christmas or maybe the one after that. I haven't mm-hmm. looked at the calendar recently, but send us in something. If you don't want to record something or you can't record something, write something out and we'll read it. I, I have gotten one or two of those that we will be uh, be reading for that episode. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and send us a, a picture or something and we'll talk about it. I, I don't know. Sure. <laughs> any, any kind of content that you listeners would like to submit and you would like to end up on the show. Send it in and we'll we'll see what we can do. Yeah. So. And if you're thinking like, oh, I want to record something, but I don't have a microphone. It's like, hey, it will, if you have a smartphone, you have a yeah. microphone. Just there's you'll just download a or usually the phones come with some sort of default like audio recording app or something. Sure. You, sure. you can find an app or something that is easily easily like records your voice into an MP3 or something. And then you yeah. can just send that to us. If the quality is really, really bad, maybe I won't use it. But I mean, I can do quite a bit to. Yeah. To clean stuff like that up. So hopefully whatever you send in, we can use. Yeah. You know, so. So, yeah, I, I would really like to get a lot of listener submissions for that. I think that'd be a fun, fun thing. We haven't really done an episode like that before. I mean, every every one of our episodes is listener submissions in some way. Right. But, you know, a, a different kind of thing. So. So, yeah, get those sent in. You can send those to our, our uh, email. Jeff, how can people get those to us? <laughs> they could send us an email <laughs> at interpartyconflict. Uh, at gmail.com and then yeah. you just attach the file to the email <laughs> sure and if you don't know how to do that just contact us somehow we'll we'll figure something out right yeah so all right you want to go ahead and get into this episode jeff sure okay i want you to imagine that you have woken up on the dreary november 26th morning and you woke up and you're you're a little bummed because you won't get to see your family today won't get to see any of your friends you know of course you get to see skylar and everything but you know it'd be nice to to See some more people. Even your neighbors would be nice. And then there's a knock on the door. Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, I, I, I throw on my mask and, and I answer the door. <laughs> okay. Well, there is nobody behind the door. You look around. You do see off in the distance a a uh, figure, a cloaked figure running away. And this figure looks particularly large. You see a, a tail, maybe some wings, maybe a breath of fire or something as they're running away. And then you look down. And you see there is a basket with turkey. There's a basket with some stuffing, some Ooh. mashed potatoes, Ooh. and some other delicious stuff. And then you see there's a little a little note card sitting on top. Oh. Uh, and it says to Jeff and Skylar. Okay. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna open up that note card. You open it up, and on the inside it says, Happy Thanksgiving from your neighbors in the Dragon's Horde. <laughs> Because I guess that's their house. Oh, sure. <laughs> yeah. They, they just, they decided to lean into it and uh, do uh, that. So uh, so today's today's magic item was submitted by Noah W via email. And the item is, I guess, simply called Magic Cupcakes. This is actually from, uh, I believe there is a Patreon campaign called Lady Tiefling. I am not super familiar with Lady Tiefling, but Noah sent me this picture that they made with uh, with some uh, some of these things, and it's it, it is six magic cupcakes and their effects is what we're going to be doing today. Cool. So I'll read the first one, and then Jeff will read the second one and go on. So, like sure. I said, there are there are six of these. So you can you can roll if you want to. The way that you would use this in a game, I guess, is maybe there's a basket of cupcakes, and then a player rolls randomly to determine which cupcake it is that they get or something. Uh-huh. But uh, the first first cupcake is called King Coco. Mm. The description is a chocolate cupcake with chocolate frosting and a little candy crown. Mm, and this has a special effect for 1d4 hours after eating. All food you consume tastes like chocolate. Awesome. 
There is a book that I, I didn't read it. I, it was when I was in second grade, my teacher read it to the class. There was this book called The Chocolate Touch. It was this children's oh. book about this kid that loves chocolate. He's always eating chocolate. His parents try to get him to eat uh, healthy food, but he doesn't like it because he always loves chocolate. And then one day he finds a magical candy shop that sells him this magical chocolate. And after he eats it, everything he puts in his mouth turns into chocolate. <laughs> and it's great. You know, it's a King Midas story, basically. It's great. Right. But then everything that he puts in his mouth turns into chocolate, including at one point he gives his mom a kiss on the cheek and, and she, she turns to chocolate. Turns to chocolate. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember how it ends. Maybe he learns a lesson. Maybe he doesn't. Maybe he just eats everybody. <laughs> Maybe he just eats everybody. He puts his mouth on the ground. And next it, it, thing the, we know. The whole world turns to chocolate. The whole world. Exactly. So that's, that's what made me, uh, that's what this made me think of. <laughs> Good. Second cupcake is the mythic cupcake. Ooh. Uh, this cupcake has frosting designed to look like a mythical creature. Mm. Eating the cupcake causes uh, you to experience 10 minutes of the uh, represented creature's life. Okay. Interesting. Ex- experience how? <laughs> that's uh, that's weird. Yeah, I, I could see that being a good thing or a bad thing, depending on what 10 minutes it's showing. Oh, right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Mythical creature, last 10 minutes of its life as it was hunted by, you know, monster hunters or something. Sure. Now, what if, instead of just being a mythical creature, it's just a just a creature? Like, what if you pick up the cupcake and it has, I don't know, the, the like, the, the big bad evil guy's face on it? Uh-huh. And then you eat it and you see 10 minutes of them preparing for their master plan or whatever. Right, yeah, you can, yeah, you can see, you can see what he's up to. Or it shows yeah. you 10 minutes of his, like, of his like early life and you're and you're like become sympathetic oh oh that's why he's such a jerk yeah he was, he, he was abused by his parents yeah they never gave him cupcakes <laughs> there you go that's that's a better answer actually <laughs> not the not what i said uh so number three is fool me twice a small cupcake that is enough for two bites it is frosted to look like a brain what take a bite and erase the last five minutes of your memory you become very confused. <laughs> so you take another. <laughs> you take a oh, bite. You take a I'm bite so of confused, this. but there's there's one more bite of this cupcake. I was like, apparently, I was eating this cupcake, and I took a bite of it. So it, it must be good. How? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> huh? Now I'm just standing here with no cupcake. That's weird. Here, okay. Here's actually an idea. Mainly because of the description that it's frosted to look like a brain. What if this is a delicacy among mind flayers Mm -hmm. and they enjoy, they actually enjoy the momentary memory loss. So like they get together, they have a party, they get together and just sit around eating these things because it makes them lose their memory. And then, and as a result, as a result, nobody knows what one of these cupcakes actually tastes like. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, so it's just like I don't know. It's just yeah, it's a fun little thing they do, or, or it's like a prank yeah. they pull on each other or something. Sure, sure. That's there. You it's go. like, hey, let's get Phil to eat this one. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's mind flayer named Phil. Yep. Uh, the next one is called the Last Wish. This cupcake is shaped uh, to resemble a tombstone. The uh. frosting is a dull gray color. Eat it to be able to ask one question of a creature that died less than one minute ago. So wait a second. So somebody just died a minute ago. I'm like, hold on, let me pull out this cupcake. How? Yeah, because you have to already have the cupcake on hand, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind. That part is kind of silly. Yeah, yeah. I like it though. I like it yeah. though. <laughs> it's like, well, in their memory, I will eat this cupcake. Oh. Hmm. I wonder. It's like I wonder where they hid their treasure. <laughs> no, here's the thing. You each had one of these cupcakes. Your buddy dies, so you eat yours and then ask him, can I eat your cupcake too? <laughs> he says no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the yeah. cupcake dies with me. <laughs> the next one is delicious blueberry. Ooh. A blueberry cupcake that is bright, yummy, and always the perfect temperature. Hmm. Eating it causes disadvantage on wisdom-based checks and saves for one hour. What? <laughs> So I guess two questions. Uh, number one, uh, what would you say is the perfect temperature for a cupcake? Like warm or cold or hot? Like mm. right out of the oven, having been sitting sitting around for, you know, a few hours. So it's room temperature or kind of in the middle. 
I'd say warmer or like, you know, like somewhat fresh from the oven or something just because. Yeah. It, and it, I guess it depends on the flavor. That's a good point. But I'd say a blueberry one, I would want it to be warm. I want it, I would want it to be a little gooey. Okay. And then, so the next question is, do you think that this is meant to be a curse or is it just that it's so good you can't even, right. you just can't even? Right. Exactly. Yep. Yep. It is just so tasty. You're <laughs> distracted. <laughs> you're just like, like, oh man. Oh, that cupcake was so good. Yeah. Guys, guys, that cupcake was... <laughs> wait, what are you doing? You're fighting something? No, 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 no. This cupcake <laughs> was so good. It's like, no, no, no. you got to try this cupcake. Try the, Please just try this cupcake. They try eat this it. Cupcake. Okay, now what's your bank account number? <laughs> <laughs> and their wisdom their wisdom check is to decide that that's not a good idea to, to give that out. <laughs> the, the next cupcake is the chroma cupcake. This colorful cupcake has a secret gooey center that is a random chromatic color. Mm. The random color determines which dragon breath ability this cupcake is uh, granting for one minute. Yes. So you eat it, and then for a minute you have red dragon's breath or blue dragon's breath or whatever. It's like, what 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 flavor do you think the different chromatic dragon fillings are? That's a good question. Yeah. I would say because in order to keep it dessert, you know, cupcake slash dessert flavored, mm. I would say red dragon should be cinnamon. Yep. I agree. I feel like green dragon should probably be like maybe lime or apple. I'd say I'd say a lime. I'd like okay. I don't know, like because like a green, like a sour green apple is what I what I'm picturing. But I don't, I yeah. don't, I don't. That doesn't sound good in a cupcake. That's yeah, that's true. I gotta agree. But with that. but like a lime, like a key lime, like a key yeah. lime filling. For uh, for yeah. black, I feel like. Maybe chocolate would be an easy answer, but right, I don't know. Dark chocolate. Ooh, da- okay, okay, I could take dark chocolate, like a, like a, like a really dark chocolate. So it's it's kind of bitter. Yeah, either that or maybe if it was like licorice flavored, right? I don't white know. like white would be like a like a peppermint. Okay, I was thinking maybe just like buttercream or something, but uh, mm. peppermint because yeah, it's 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 icy, so right, I some, sort of, some sort of mint. It's mint. Yeah, and then what do we got left? Uh, uh, blue. blue. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess blueberry. Pop rocks. <laughs> Pop rocks flavored. Okay. I'm, I'm down with that. Right, because it's, it's the electricity kind of crackling. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. All right. All right. We did it. Awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, once again, that was, uh, there isn't really much else to this. I think it's just it's just a fun little little item. But that was Magic Cupcakes and their effects. It was sent in by Noah W., but uh, it is uh, it was created by Lady Tiefling. I'll, I'll throw the link to their uh, their Patreon in here. Yeah. Um, I'm not even sure what what it is they do except make magic cupcake uh, stat stat blocks. Right. Yeah. So so yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Noah W, for submitting that. Uh, so Jeff, if anybody else wanted to submit magic items for the Dragon's Horde, or if they wanted to submit questions for us to discuss, or stories for the funeral pyre or retirement village, how would they get those to us? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail dot com, or join us on our interparty Discord at bit.ly slash interparty discord. That's correct. And before we go any further, we do have a giveaway to give away today. Ooh. As usual, we're giving away a copy of Unearthed Tips and Tricks Volume 2, courtesy of Crit Academy. It is a, a great product that I helped them write. It is a collection of 25 character concepts and counter concepts, magic items, monster variants, player tips, and DM tips, all from the Crit Academy podcasts. There's tons of content in there for players, for DMs, for everybody. It's a great, great supplement. So who is the winner of this free supplement today? Today's winner is Scott T. Whoa, 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 winner. Gobble, gobble, gobble. Yes, congratulations, Scott T. You should be getting that in your email pretty soon. Uh, if you don't, if you haven't gotten it within a week, I guess, let us know. Uh, and once you do get it, be sure to leave Crit Academy a review. Whether you like it or don't like it, hopefully you like it. But uh, if you leave them a reviews, it'll help them make better products in the future and also get more attention as well. So, uh, So, yeah. Thank you to Crit Academy for facilitating this giveaway. Congratulations, Scott T. If anybody else wanted to be like Scott T and they wanted to win a copy of this supplement, how would they do that? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with Unearthed Tips and Tricks Volume 2 in the subject line. Yes, please put the Volume 2 in there so I know which one you're asking about. Uh, next up, I want to thank all of our wonderful patrons for supporting us during these these tough times. Um, for anybody who's not aware, Patreon is an online platform. You can pledge to donate a certain amount of money per month to the creator of your choice. If you donate to us, we've got 
outtakes. We've got a monthly bonus podcast called Interpatron Conflict. We just put out the uh, the episode for November. It was supposed to be out for October. We had a bunch of uh, a bunch of technical difficulties and such, so I put out something else in October, and this one came out in November. We played through um, the the RPG is called Scream the Horror. It's a horror themed, uh, you know, it's like it's a two page RPG. It's not a one page RPG, but we played through this game in a, a little little scenario that I came up with that was uh, loosely based on the movie The Thing, and yeah. uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. You know, yeah, it's it, good. It, it's a it's about three hours long, is you know longer than I originally intended it to be, but you know, it's how that goes, I guess. Yeah, sure. Um, but yeah, it was a lot of fun. So if you if you join our Patreon, you can. That's one of the benefits you can get, along with all the other uh, bonus episodes we've done in the past. We've also got a monthly Roll Twenty game. We just uh, two days ago we just we just played our Roll Twenty game for November, um, and we're playing in a world that we created using Dawn of Worlds, the yeah. um, the world building RPG. We, played that a couple of months ago and uh, I think it went pretty well. We'll, we'll play another game in December after December. It's going to be a little up in the air for what we do with, uh, with the top tier after that. Cause I don't know with my work schedule changing. I don't know if I'm going to have time to run a monthly game. Right. Yeah. It's going to be tricky for you. So please bear with us. If anybody did want to cancel or reduce their pledge because of that, I understand, but uh, you know, we're, we're going to see what we can do and try to give the best benefits to our, to our patrons as we can. Mm-hmm. So um, if you head to patreon.com slash interparty conflict, you can go check out the rewards of the different tiers and then see if anything appeals to you so you can help out the show and get some cool stuff in return. And we know it's not the best time to be asking people for money. If anybody is not able to, or not able or not willing to contribute, no problem. We totally understand. We have had some people cancel or reduce their pledges in the last few months. And Hey, it happens. Yep. Hopefully someday you'll come, you know, you'll come back, but if not, thank you for the time that the time and money that you did contribute so far. Yeah. So big thank you to everybody out there. Um, once again, just check that out if you want to at patreon.com slash interparty conflict. You guys are awesome. You help keep the lights on and uh, and help us keep putting out good content. Yeah, thank you. And then just one more quick thing. Check out the other podcasts at Crit Nation Fellowship. Check out Crit Academy, CritAcademy.com. Justin, Ian, and Austin create new and reusable content for players and DMs alike. Also check out Brute Force and Ignorance. They are an actual play podcast. And check out D&D Character Lab, where Garen and Dan made characters every week and pitted them against each other to debate whose characters were better. Enough of all the plugs. Let's get into some questions, Jeff. Our first question comes from The Beverage Tea on Discord, and they ask, Would you ever consider giving a character an allergy to magic, either mechanical or purely for flavor? Yeah, I think this is an interesting question. And then... The simple answer would be either yes or no, right? But yeah. I think I think we should uh, we should also talk about what sort of uh, you know how the, how such a thing would manifest yeah. mechanically or thematically or whatever. Uh, like I don't think I've ever thought of this, but I think this is amazing. This is a great idea. Like yeah, like it, you know simple simple answer for flavor. Go go for it. It's all that's awesome. Sure. sure, making it somewhat mechanical is a bit more tricky, but could also be really cool. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, like I never really thought of anything like this, and I just I like I want yeah a character that's allergic to like a specific type of magic. Oh, okay, yeah, like f- like fire magic. You know, like fire yeah. magic is pretty common, but it's like maybe maybe they have an allergic reaction. You know, like their skin breaks out or something whenever they're near fire magic. Okay, so like let's let's not bother with mechanical stuff for the time being. So let's say someone is is allergic to fire magic. So is that just whenever they take fire damage from a magical source, they yeah. or just break like, out into hives or whatever? Or if fire magic is cast, you know, in a somewhat you know arbitrary, oh, okay. but you know, not not huge, but like you know, a small radius, basically. Sure. So like if they're within thirty feet or something like that, yeah. Then just the magic itself makes them, you know break out right or it's just like you know it could be just something silly just anytime spe- someone cast any spell they sneeze you know <laughs> sure <laughs> you know and that like that could come out that could come to bite them like if they're trying to be stealthy or something but yeah i see that that's one of those things that like if, if it makes it harder for them to be sneaking around like that's the kind of thing i would want to give like inspiration for sure you like reward them for be like like oh you remembered that little thing about your character even though it's gonna it's gonna hurt you in this instance like here have an inspiration. That's actually a really good point. I think that if you did want to do something like this, it could very easily fit into part of your uh part of your back like the the fifth edition backgrounds. Yeah, with the, like, um, the flaws. So, yeah, put it in the flaws. I'm allergic to magic. 
Yeah. And then, yeah, anytime that you do, uh, if anytime you do disadvantage yourself as a result of being allergic to magic, the DM can give you inspiration, which you can then use to offset, you know, something else. Gabe, they're allergic to magic, but they're a sorcerer, so it's in their blood, and so, like, they're just sick all the time. Like, that's their yeah. character, is, like, they're always, like, they're always sick. Like, they're always sneezing and itching and sure, coughing sure. and stuff like that, but, like, and it's like, is this, what, what's, like, what's, what's wrong with this guy? He's like, oh, he's allergic to magic. He's allergic to himself. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, I don't know. Like, this just, yeah, this sounds like a, like a neat little character quirk. I really like it. Yeah. I feel like in, uh, instead of doing, you know, being allergic to like fire magic or whatever, I think it should be school based. Mm -hmm. So like, oh, abjuration. No, please don't, please don't cast, uh, you know, (laughs) please don't cast mage armor around me. I'm allergic. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) It's like, oh, are you, are you, are you casting mirror image right now? Oh, I can't, I can't. Uh, Illusion magic just uh, makes me, it makes me break out into hives. But then here's the thing. They're allergic to illusion magic, so when they're walking along the the hallway and they pass by that illusory wall, oh, then so they now, start to break out, and that's how they know. See, now we're getting into like mechanical because I, I suppose, it, yeah. If that's a if that is a quirk, even if it's just a flavor quirk, like if the DM you know wants wants to let them have that flavor quirk, they might have to work that into into the actual mechanics somehow. Yeah, maybe. So it's like you know, uh, yeah that that does sort of. That does sort of raise that question. It's like if you're allergic to a to any magic or a specific type of magic, mm-hmm. like would that would that allergy manifest when the when the DM doesn't want you to know, you know? Like sure, sure. When it would otherwise be a secret. Like, you know, you're you're holding yeah, like an illusion, like you're, you know, in the presence of an illusion. Mm-hmm. Well, maybe it's I mean, for an illusion, because a lot of illusions you have to like interact with them to okay. like to know what they are. So you could say like, okay, you're allergic, but like, it's not like a, you know, you have to actually like interact with the thing, the thing. So like your, you know, the way, the way that you tell that it's an illusion is you notice oh. that you're breaking out. So, but yeah, if you don't make the check or whatever, you know, you don't, you don't notice it because you're just used to, you know, you're just, you're just used to, you're just used to getting sick every once in a while or something like that. Sure. Sure. So, you know, you're just flavor, you're just flavoring the mechanics, but the mechanics are still the same. Yeah. Back in 4th edition there was there was a mechanic called spell plague or like uh, I guess spell touched was actually what the mechanic was called. But in in the Forgotten Realms of the 4th edition era there was this thing called the spell plague that kind of like went across the plains and it like warped creatures, it killed creatures, it destroyed landscapes. It had very long basically it was how they were justifying a lot of the changes they were making to the canon. Of the the campaign setting. Okay. And so mechanically, there was a thing you could choose when you made your character. You could choose whether your character was spell touched or not. And what that meant was anytime you encounter another creature that is spell touched, just creature or effect or whatever. I I don't remember exactly what it was, but I think it was essentially you had it was the fifth edition equivalent would be you have advantage on all checks or attacks or whatever against a spell touched creature. However, they also have that same thing against you. Right. And in the same way, you could kind of use that as a way to find out if a creature was spell touched. Sure. If you weren't able to tell, let's say you encountered another, you know, an NPC that was hiding that. If you realized, Oh, wait a minute. I'm, I have this sort of, you know, connection to this person or aversion to this person or whatever. You could use that as a way to to know that about them and then know that you have this advantage and disadvantage against them. <laughs> so similarly, if you did want to make magic allergy some kind of a mechanical thing, you could use that as a way to, yeah, that's how I, I can always tell when there's illusions nearby. Because whenever I'm near illusions, I start taking damage or something like that. Right. Huh. Yeah, that could be a trade-off. Like, you take damage from illusions, but you can detect them easier. <laughs> sure, sure. What do you think would be some uh, some mechanical effects of an allergy to magic? Hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, like, other than, yeah, like, being able to detect it, uh, it, it could be, like, the, the symptoms of the allergies themselves are magical effects, too. Okay. Um, you know, like, you, you start sneezing, but your sneezes are... You know, t- your sneezes are like breath weapons or something. I don't know. <laughs> you sneeze out magic missiles every now and then. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, <laughs> something to that effect. 
Um, or like, you know, you, you break out into hives, but the hives pro provide some sort of, you know, uh, protection or something. They make like the okay. heart, your skin hardens or something. Maybe whenever you're, whenever somebody casts a, an enchantment on you, you gain one temporary hit point. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I can see different trade-offs. Like you take a disadvantage on this because you're sick or whatever, but you have an extra, you know, you get an extra hit point or something. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you're like, your hair falls out. Uh, <laughs> gosh, I don't know. Like your hair falls out, but you gain a, you know, you you gain a plus one on stealth checks. Right, because you have less wind resistance. Or <laughs> I, I was or, thinking like you sort of start to blend in with everything around you. I don't know. And your yeah, hair yeah. was somehow stopping that. I don't know. <laughs> No, 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 no. You lose all your hair and then you get like, you know, an extra, f you know, uh, you get advan advantage on swimming athletics checks. <laughs> okay. Okay. Because you move that through works. the water, uh, you know, better. Yeah. Less, less drag. <laughs> so, but yeah, uh, I, I think, I think this is a really good idea. I think that it's, it's a very cool thing to opt into. Mm -hmm. Um, We've talked about on, we had an episode a while ago about uh, playing like a blind character. A lot of the time when people want to play a blind character, they... They take this huge disadvantage because they are expecting to get an equal advantage. Right. And, you know, that if that is made explicit at the beginning, that can work. But I think that uh, it would be interesting if someone was willing to just take a just a mechanical disadvantage. And then, you know, may, maybe if it was something that gave them inspiration every now and then, I suppose. But yeah, um, even if it was just like a temporary thing, if there was something in the game that happened that made you temporarily allergic to certain types of magic. Mm -hmm. That could be an interesting plot point because then a driving force for the campaign could be to go on a pilgrimage to perform some ritual to get rid of your allergy. I don't yeah. know. Yeah, certain certain things like that, like flaws and stuff. Like if it's you know if it's a flaw that's not yeah it's not intended to be like oh I want to trade this out for something cool like you know I, I like because there was I think in third edition or something you could like take a flaw to give yourself an extra feat or something. Yeah, does that sound right? Yeah, I think but, so. Yeah. If the idea was just I wanted to have my I have my character have this weird quirk, like mm -hmm. I thought it was like neat. Sure, if it gives me a penalty, whatever. But I think it's interesting. Yeah, that's the thing that like the DM can use to like give you inspiration when you use it when you like bring it up, or or it's just, it's just something that the DM can use to like I don't know, just use as a as just a, there's a thing in their back pocket that they can use to kind of like help move something along, or you know push the push the the, the the players in a certain direction or something yeah so it's just more it's more tools that the dm can use hopefully they're not an evil dm and are just going to use it to screw <laughs> you over sure but if it's something that makes their life a little easier it, it'll actually benefit you because then like you know you're i don't know it's like it's bringing your character in the spotlight a little bit more and like yeah. they might want to reward you more for it because like oh this was really useful to me for getting you guys to go to this one place I wanted you to go, you know, not, not necessarily in like, I have to railroad you just in like, well, okay, we, we should try to move in this direction just to, you know, get to the fun part. Sure. Uh, so like, let's, let's have it. Oh, he sneezed. Okay. Now they know there's an illusion there and now they find the secret door. Okay. Now they can get to the cool treasure that I wanted them to have. Yeah. I, I like that sort of thing as a DM. I like when players are uh, willing to, to give me things that I can use to screw them over. I rarely do. But I like having the option of just ways to get them into the story. But then also, when I'm the player, I like giving those sort of things to the DM because, like you said, it gets it puts me in the spotlight. If I can give the DM something that he can use to screw me over, but that means that the adventure is going to be about me, that's cool yeah. too. Yeah, even if it's just it just for that moment, you know, it's just like, yeah. oh, cool, I got to go. I, I did a cool thing that had to do with my character because that's how I built them. You know, like that's right. that's fun. Yeah, I, I feel like yeah, stuff like that just adds fun. Yeah, something that you made about your character that becomes part of the world building is always its own reward and often leads to more rewards down the line. Right, yep. Yeah, so. that's fun. Yeah. All right, our next question is from Dustin. Ding. On Discord, and he asks, how important is it to litter your campaign with subtle clues to the major plot point? Yeah, so I think that uh, this, it is important because when you want there to be uh, some sort of like, uh, you know, an a major plot that is gonna gonna have been going on the whole time. You always want players to be able to look at it and be like, "Oh my goodness, how did I not see this coming?" Right. Whenever, like, let's say you're reading a murder mystery or you're watching a murder mystery movie or whatever, the best murder mystery is one where you feel like 
you were just about to predict the ending. You didn't, but you were about to. You you feel like you could have. Mm-hmm. Not all of them, not all murder mysteries and such do that. Some of them are good at making you think that, even though technically they didn't give you any of the crucial information until after, you know, un- until way too late in the story for you to have done that. But the best, the best reveal is when the players are like, I knew, th- I, I, I feel like I knew that was coming. Yeah. They didn't know it was coming, but they feel like they did. Right. So you, you definitely do want to leave clues so that later on you can be like, I didn't just pull this out of my, out of my butt. This was, I've been setting this up for the entire time. So you can point out, okay, there was this clue, there was this clue and there was this clue and so on. But also you don't want to leave too many of those because you do want it to be a, you don't want the players to, to get it too early and then possibly work against it. Right. You know, and you don't want it to be so, un- you don't want so little that you're just like, well, that came out of left field. Like, was like, sure, what is going sure. on? Who is this guy? Like the big bad evil shows up and you're like, I have no idea who this guy is. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, um, we have, so, so our good friend, Steve, um, Steve and I have been recording for the last almost two years. <laughs> we are coming up on two years. Wow. Really? We, yes, we have been working on cause two years ago, uh, not last January, but the January before I had like three weeks off from work and I decided, Hey, let me start three new podcasts. Right. Only two of which I actually recorded and both of them ended up being way more than I could handle. And so one of them, we just put out a few months ago. Uh, but anyway, so we've been recording this podcast and it's about this TV show, this, this network suspense thriller TV show from 1995 called nowhere man starring Bruce Greenwood. It's a TV show that I was a big fan of when it was on. And then like in the early 2000s, I bought the DVDs and I, I, I made Steve watch them then, or I made him watch like the first half of the show and then he forgot about them all. So we've been, I, we've been watching it from the beginning and then doing very, very long, very in-depth episodes about them. None mm. of the episodes are out, listeners, just so you know. Yeah. We've been recording it for two years. Not a single episode has gone up on the internet yet. Right. Maybe now that we ha- we're one episode from being done. Maybe once they're done, we'll finally get them up on the internet. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> but one of my biggest gripes about this show is that it is, it does have a major plot that is going from the beginning to the end. It is about intrigue. It is about mystery. However, it became very clear that the writers did not know what the mystery was until like the last two or three episodes. They, they didn't have enough information to leave proper hints. They left some vague hints that could have meant anything that once the show is done, you can look back and be like, you know, maybe that's what they meant here. Maybe that's what they meant here. But if you do any digging whatsoever, you find out, no, they didn't mean anything. They just (laughs) they thought that would be a weird detail to put in. So they did. And now it's only because you're looking at it with the lens of knowing the twist at the end that it starts to to make sense. Right. So. That there another show that was on, on around the time the same time was The X Files, made by Chris Carter. And that show was famous for similarly the 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 viewers could tell that the writer didn't know where it was going. So whenever a big plot point came around, it wasn't adequately built up. It didn't really feel like they had laid the groundwork. It felt like they were just throwing out random stuff and then later on decided, okay, yeah, sure, this is what the the twist is gonna be. Yeah. You don't want that. That it's it's hard to do it right, but there is a way to do it right, and and it, it does require knowing what the plot is ahead of time. If you know the plot, and it seems like from talking with Dustin about the campaign that he's running, it does seem like he knows the plot, or at least he knows a lot about the plot well in advance, and that's the best place to be. So you you do want to leave clues the players are going to to find. You don't want to give too many clues, both because you don't want them to figure out the mystery too early. But also, if you want to change something later on, you don't want to be too beholden to the mystery you were starting early on. Mm -hmm. You might realize halfway through the story, oh, you know, this isn't good. This this is not going to work as well as I thought it was. And in that case, you do want there to be gaps so that you can change it if necessary. You uh, you might. You might want to resist the urge to change it just because the players are starting to figure it out. A player figuring out the mystery is is not a problem. It might be something you want to avoid. Like I said, you don't want them to figure it out too early. But if they do, that's better than them not getting it at all and then being confused when it finally comes out. 
uh gabe uh uh well, <laughs> i was doing a quick little look up on uh on nowhere man yeah do you want to know how many awards uh nowhere man has been uh nominated for oh how many i, I don't know why i don't already know this how many awards has it been nominated for one oh Jeez, what what award is that? It's won zero awards, but it's been nominated for one award. That award, outstanding main title theme music. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> well, the theme music is pretty good. Right. Made by Mark Snow, who also made the X Files music. Uh, so, wow. I can't say I'm surprised. It's only been nominated for one award and it's for the theme music. Yeah. <laughs> oh goodness. So stay tuned, listeners. I yes, guess in a few for... months, maybe the first episode of this this Nowhere Man podcast will be out. I mean, it's yeah, it's you and Steve talking. I could I could probably listen to that for all you know for eternity. Like that'd well, be entertaining. Here, here's the thing: Lisa has started listening to it. Back during quarantine, whenever she would go on bike rides, she would listen to uh, to our podcast. She doesn't listen to long podcasts at all. And I said earlier, like, we go really in depth. I'm talking, we have like three or four hour long episodes about a 45 minute episode of a TV show. <laughs> and it's, it's not off topic. That's the thing with this podcast. Occasionally the episodes will go a little long because we go on a tangent or whatever. Right. Like which this one. Arguably this is. <laughs> yeah. But on, on this Nowhere Man podcast, we, we stay on topic for basically the entire four hours or whatever. Right. <laughs> so, so. I don't know. Anyway, so so it is important. It, I would say it is very important to litter your campaign with subtle clues because you don't the le- the last thing you want is for the players to feel like the twist comes out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. Nowhere, man. <laughs> <laughs> but but again, if if you have too many clues, that can be a problem. It's less bad of a problem, but it can be a problem. So try to try to have enough that you can point back to and be like oh see that was a that was a clue um but not enough that the players they're like oh no we yeah we we knew that in fact it was so obvious we thought that was a bluff oh yeah you know you don't want that (laughs) (laughs) right so you don't want it to be so obviously the obvious that they like avoid it because they're like "Eh, this is just he's trying to get me to do this but i'm not gonna because it's so obvious sure maybe you want it obvious enough just obvious enough so that the most experienced player at the table thinks they know it so that they can drive the rest of the of the party in that direction. Sure. So that sure. so that it's one of the party members doing the railroading. <laughs> I I mean that's that works. <laughs> cuz it's cuz like I I feel like, you know, I'm sure I've I've been in a, in an adventure where I was like I was like I I'm pretty sure I know where this is going. So I'm going to be like, yeah. "Hey, let's check this out," you know, like <laughs> And I you know, in I'm pretty sure I'm going to be wrong in most of those cases where I just like, I think I know what's going to happen. And then it's just, you know, I might be in the right direction, but it's not the right. My, but, you know, the actual thing was I was wrong on. Sure. So um, here's here's an idea. If you I mean, this is this is coming from a privileged place. So, like, if you are so confident in your ability to to leave hints, if there is a way that you can leave hints that each hint points to two potential things. So, like. The players might see the hint coming from a mile away, but once they find the hint, they're like, but wait a minute, it's got a picture of a dragon on it. Is that because this dragon is behind it? Or is it because, you know, the the Thieves Guild, which calls themselves the, I don't know, Blue Dragons or something, then maybe they're behind it. Like if if there was some way that you could have each hint in and of itself be another puzzle. Kind of sure, yeah, it, yeah. They're, they're not so straightforward. They they could, yeah, it could be a couple different things. And then that that leaves it open for if the players assume it is if they if they if you do want to change it later on, you can have be like, oh no, no, that was it was hinting at that other thing. It wasn't hinting yeah. at the, the 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 thieves guild. It was hinting at the actual dragon. Right. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know, or you know, it could be a way to kind of bu- uh, you know. Uh, buffer out the the adventure a bit like they go for one of them but you have it be you you know whichever they pick have it be the other one <laughs> sure sure so you could be able just to kind of like stretch out the adventure a bit so like oh like oh it's definitely the thieves guild and they go and they investigate the thieves guild and the thieves guild was up to no good they find out but it wasn't and it didn't you know have a connection to the thing they were looking for yeah so oh no it was the dragon and then <laughs> cut to the dragon attacking the town or something i don't know Right. It's it is easier said than done setting up a hint that is simultaneously a hint to two separate 
uh, plot points. But yeah, you know, if if you are able to do so, that's gonna that's gonna serve you in the long run. I think. <laughs> so that's the okay. So yeah, you just have you just have the plot be like several different things and then you give them a clue that can be any one of those things and whichever they pick that's the wrong one you guys got it wrong haha <laughs> tricked you i guess so i guess so and you know have it be a surprise but like you know it's like oh you guys were so close <laughs> yeah yeah i don't really have have much else for this one just it is very important but it is possible to overdo it so know what you're doing ahead of time and then do whatever you feel is appropriate after that like if you don't know what's it can be tempting to throw out clues that you don't know what you're going to do with later. And doing that in moderation is fine, but don't overdo that. Right. Yeah. Because, yeah, you might have a handful of clues that the players took to heart, but yeah. you have completely forgotten about and haven't even built on at all. And they, they bring up like, but what about this one thing? And you're like, oh, I that's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I lost those notes. Right. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. I think that'll do it for our regular questions for today, but we do still have our social media questions. Our last social media question, which feels like it was years ago, was if you could design a computer program or app to make playing or running D&D games easier, what would it do? Do you recall if you had an answer? D&D and VR. That's what I want. (laughs) Pretty much. Everything that I came up with was like, I would love to be able to walk around a dungeon that I made. Yeah. It was so fun. I remember... Uh, there was a one of the SimCity games. I had a SimCity game for like PlayStation, I think. I think it was SimCity 2000. Had this option where once you've built a city, you could drive around your city. Now, it was incredibly like low poly. I don't even think it 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 like loaded any buildings. It was just whatever the roads were. You could drive along pretty much like a blank void but you would be driving along the road that you built and you could oh. turn or turn left or right or whatever. Okay. Um, which I thought was a really neat concept. And then once like Grand Theft Auto became a big thing, I never really played Grand, Grand Theft Auto, but I thought, what if there was a game where you you built a town and then you could like go down into your town as a person and then you could like going with Grand Theft Auto because it was so popular at the time. What if you could try to break into houses in the town that you built <laughs> to test your police officers? Right. Yeah. Do something like that. Yeah, something like that I think would be really cool. Similarly, in D&D, if there was a way that you could build a dungeon and then hit a button like Google Street View and then walk around (laughs) your dungeon and see where the monsters are, test out some fights, test out some traps, I would love something like that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that'd be be a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, I, I even feel like... If someone could like make a Minecraft mod that did basically that, as long as it's just if if you could build everything from an outside view and then go into the first person view of your character. Yeah, I think would be really cool. Like there are definitely like tools to do stuff like that to an extent, but there, it does require like a bit of imagination and like it, yeah. you, you like it's not like user friendly stuff or anything. So sure. like there are like editing tools for Minecraft that do make something like that easy, but it's not like it's not. It's not like everybody can do it easy, though. You you have to have yeah. some bit of, like, 3D modeling, you know, ex- sure, experience, sure. you know, to an extent. Yeah. Either that or you got to practice with it a lot. So it's, Yeah. You know. So I, anything that is user-friendly enough to be accessible to your typical dungeon master. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like building houses in The Sims... Yeah. People like, you know, people can wrap their heads around that pretty easy. Like, it's a, like some people just play The Sims just to build houses. Yeah. Because like true. the tools are kind of like, especially the new the newer games, like the tools are really easy to get to get around. So like, I yeah. feel like you know if if the you know something is easy as that into making dungeons that you could then like view from you know a view from you know first person just to kind of get a feel of how you've built things. Sure. Uh, we got a few responses over on Facebook. Jason E says it would be called a calendar app. And before every player left the table, they had to pick a date on the calendar app to play next. <laughs> if they missed that date, the calendar app would electrocute them. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah. All right. OK. I mean, that dang that serves a purpose. <laughs> uh, Kyle S says D&D Beyond, but with a more robust combat tracker that allowed for changes on the fly. I'd also like for it to have a soundboard for music and soundscapes. Yeah. So yeah, soundboards and, and sound like soundscapes and stuff, those those add so much. They're they're a yeah. lot of fun. 
Ryan P. says, a highly advanced AI DM for my group to use so that we can all be PCs and enjoy the antics. Dude, that, you know, <laughs> like, that would be something. Like, yeah. even if it was, even if it was only, like, okay, it would still be really good, right? It, like, it would, because it's you and all your friends hanging out, and if you're responding to the same stimulus, you can have fun with it, especially if you don't have to worry about making somebody feel bad. Right. <laughs> you know. Like, I feel, I feel like if they can, if you can, like, if you can make that, like, just barely workable, I feel like yeah. that would still be really, <laughs> really good. Like, it's definitely, like, near impossible, if not yeah. impossible right now, you know, right. like, to, to make that a, a thing. You know, like there are video games, but like you're you're they're programming the whole video game. Like you know, they're give they're building each level individually. We're talking like you know more more or less. You know, there is room for improv within within the AI, which is not you know yeah. that's not an easy feat. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it it is definitely asking a lot, but at some point, I feel like it will be easy to do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, like stuff like that is exponential. Where it's just like you yeah. know the like you'll you'll look at graphics from like 10 years ago and they and they thought like there's no way or um, 10 years ago i'm thinking like actually like 20, 20 years 30 ago. years ago yeah you look at graphics back then and like the people who were in the industry would be like we can't there's no way we're ever going to get better than this like this is the yeah. best graphics is ever going to be it's amazing there's no way we're going to be able to top this and now you got like deep fake you know like, yeah yeah <laughs> Um, Ryan P actually said, uh, there was one more thing he said, uh, I recently started DMing and I can't help but wish I were a player with my group in some scenarios so I can add chaos to the story rather than running damage control for the chaos my players already caused. <laughs> so, so yeah, that's, that's, uh, Ryan's motivation for, for sure. wanting an AI DM instead of having to be the DM. And I so, totally so, understand that. So that's the motivation for him building the AI that, that brings about <laughs> the end of the world. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> The whole, I the, didn't want to bring about the end of the world myself. I wanted an AI to do it. Right, right. You make Skynet, but it's actually a D. It's just a DM trying to T, uh, TPK everybody. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sean M says, allow us to access the content of all of our books for a single monthly fee. This is something that really sticks in my craw, given the value of content available for $15 a month on Netflix versus relatively little without spending more money on D&D Beyond. Yeah. Yep, yeah. yep. I I agree with that. It's like, like you know, we've talked about D&D Beyond in the past. I think that there's definitely a lot of room for improvement with that kind of a model. Yeah. I would, yeah. I would I would pay it, you know, 10, you know, 10 to 20 dollars a month for access to all PDFs and stuff. Like Yeah. And like that'd be a thing where it's like, all right, you know, we're going to be playing this this campaign for a few months. You know, I'll I'll pay these, you know, this many dollars and it's like I'm still getting more than my money's worth of content, mm -hmm. you know, in those few months that I was able to, you know, use them. So I don't yeah. know. I feel like, yeah, you're yeah, it could there could be something. Yeah. Uh, over on Reddit, Nymphamos, I think Nymph Amos, N oh. Nymphamos says something Nymphamos. that has both D&D &D Beyond style character sheet with dice with something that is like roll 20 that's easier to use. <laughs> so I can see that like. Uh, D and D D and D beyond has, you know, the, all like the compendium and stuff. Roll 20 has that, some of that too, but it, that's, it, it focuses more on the virtual tabletop. And if there were a way to combine the two and make it easy to use, that would be pretty yeah. good. Yeah. The, the, the paid one I got, the foundry is yeah. like, is, is, is a pretty, like it's, it's like D 20, but better. I, at least I, you know, if it, it seems friendlier and there's like add-ons and stuff, so you can have like dice rollers and things like that. So like there are some virtual tabletops out there that are a little bit more complex yeah, and it'll have a lot of features that people like, but you know, they either cost money or they're, or they take some learning how to use and it's not, yeah. it's not yeah. so straightforward. Um, Alistar the Minotaur says something that would streamline combat. For instance, it would link every player's character sheet with whatever monster stat block I'd happen to be using. So my players only have to press attack and the dice roll is generated and damage applied automatically, taking into account resistances and such. Combat, while fun, can bog down the game some and it would give me a better opportunity to narrate the combat instead of checking stat blocks and HP pools. Mm -hmm. Um I there is there's an edit on the end of this, but I, I will say I definitely agree with that because I know whenever I am running a game on roll twenty or whatever, 
I am constantly having to like, okay, let me check this. So I've got one tab open with this monster stats. So I got to check that one. Okay, they rolled this. Oh, whoops, that's the wrong monster. The, I, the, the next monster. Oh, wait a minute. How much damage do they do? The, there's two of these monsters. They did damage to this one. So I have to write that down on a physical sheet while I have the tab open on the computer with the stats. It would be part of that is me being very poor at planning how I'm how to how to make this easier for myself. But also, if it was as simple as you know, it's all it, they just click a button or they just roll one thing or whatever. I don't know. But Alistar did add on an edit. I retract this. After speaking with my better half, we agreed that something like this would remove one of the elements of the game we enjoy the most, rolling dice. I can also understand that. Sure. Something yeah. definitely would be lost. So not everybody, I understand if not everybody would agree with this. I see values in both. You know, I'd be I'd be cool checking out with, with trying out a more streamlined thing for a little while and seeing how it, how it feels. Mm -hmm. So over on Twitter, we got uh, just one response. I think Uh, Eric R says it would create maps for me. Mapping is my least favorite part of being a DM. Thankfully, so many people make, make gorgeous maps for me to use. (laughs) Um, And yeah, I, I totally agree. Like my, I'm terrible at making maps. My first, my first adventures that I ran, the maps were basically just a straight line with a couple of 90 degree turns in it. So it was just kind of, one hallway the players went along. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I mean, I've, I've come away since then, but still map making software is, is, uh, is a good, good thing to have. Yeah. Um, the, the one I was using, was it called dungeon draft? Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's pretty easy to use. Like, and it's, you know, there's, there's not like a ton of options, but there's enough to get by on. And like, I was able to make a couple decent looking, you know, battle maps and like there was a like there was a dungeon that you guys never got to that i uh that i that i built out that i'm fairly like oh, sure. visually i'm proud of but like the mechanics of the dungeon itself was just sort of like eh, whatever yeah uh but you know i'm sure i'm sure like if somebody is the good with coming up idea with ideas but not so much good on putting it down on paper like something like the tool like this kind of helps kind of helps bridge that a little bit sure so like there are some dungeon map making not like okay. i've i've tried a few of them and some of them are awful, just <laughs> awful, yeah, like counterintuitive, so 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 badly. Uh, but uh, so far, so far, my the one I've worked with and has been easiest to work with is uh, Dungeon Draft. Okay. Well, over on Discord, we got just a few. Uh, Dustin says a running turn counter, listing AC and conditions. Mm-hmm. That'd be pretty good. Just simple, simple thing. Just being able to easily check everybody's AC, everybody's conditions, and go down the line with uh, initiative. The beverage T says a calendar nuke button that would clear all the players' calendars of all family, <laughs> kids, business, in laws. They're not really family after all, and other tedious crap. So we could schedule consistent meeting times. Is that too much to ask for? <laughs> a pocket dimension uh, uh, <laughs> for only for playing D anD. d Like it's it's pretty like much the, yeah. It's the, it's the room of spirit and time from, uh, from <laughs> Dragon Ball. Yep. Uh, but it's it's set up for playing D anD. d Sure, I I feel that. Uh, Stiltskin Koopo eighty four says I'd make a cringe app. The app would alert the DM during moments that make their players cringe. Hate something your fellow player did? Hit the cringe button. DM allowing something a bit too explicit? Hit the cringe button. Someone, someone at the table swearing or over talking or whatever a bit too much. As a DM who has had players leave a campaign without notice, I would appreciate having a cringe app available so that I know my players are having a problem in real time when I can course correct and fit it rather than after the fact when it's often too late. Sure. Yeah. Anything that helps you just be more aware of of the the social dynamics at play in your game, I think <laughs> couldn't hurt. Actually, yeah, like it's like a button they can hit anonymously, so it's like I'm like it's like and there's somebody can be like, I'm not having a good time and like kind of like ping the DM and be like, so, you know, sure, so, sure. So the DM can be like, OK, whatever's going on right now is upsetting somebody. So I'm going to I'm going to kind of shift gears a little bit. You know, that's that's actually a really good idea. I've heard yeah. of some groups having a thing where like each player has, a, I don't know, like a, a colored card they can lift up. And if they sure. do just whatever, whatever is currently going on, just move on. Just, yeah. you know. No, no, even don't even address what the player did. Just just move on. Do right. something else. You yeah, know. it's a yeah, it's a get out of cringe free uh, I- <laughs> card. <laughs> yep, that's good. Uh, Debrasaur says one where DM invites everyone to the session with a session code like Jackbox games and the DM can instantly see all the player sheets would be so great c- for conventions. Mm hmm. 
that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, if 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 it was, I know with like Roll Twenty or whatever, um, it, you have to send them like a big long link of of you know letters and numbers and stuff. But if it was as simple as like, oh yeah, just put in this four digit code, and then it'll it'll automatically load up all of your character sheet and stuff. Yeah, that ever you know that that would be pretty neat. Yeah, there's yeah there's definitely some room for streamlining as far as virtual tabletops go. Um, yeah, but I mean like I f- like it's going in the right direction from what sure, I can definitely. from what I've seen. So. Uh, and then one more autumn wind says project a randomly generated combat grid that is customizable by terrain type percentage, difficult terrain percentage, water hazard and features like road fork in the road, wagon buildings, etc. I love the immersion of realistic maps and terrain details can make combat strategy more interesting than charge attack that bag of hit points, move on to the next one. And it takes time to design and draw those things. Mm-hmm. So yeah, similarly, like I was saying, I'm, I'm terrible at making maps. It'd be great to have an app that, makes uh, or it makes dungeons for you making battle maps similarly would be really cool even if it was just like it's got this set of things and then this set of things and this set of things and just puts them in random spots yeah there was back when uh back when i was playing fourth edition one day i came up i drew out this like little battle area this like little little room or whatever and i i drew on there was like an elevated portion there was a pit in one corner there were some obstacles to hide behind. There was some difficult terrain. And then I ran a whole bunch of different encounters in this same room. Every time the players were coming from, there were like two hallways going off in either direction. Like sometimes the player would be coming in one hallway. Another time they'd be coming in another. Sometimes they would be coming up from the hole in the ground. And then I just kind of, I kept using that exact same encounter space, just rotating it or you know, starting the players off and the monsters off in different locations in order to see how everything works. And something like that, even as simple as that, as just give me one interesting encounter and then let me just change some details, I think would be pretty cool. Yeah. So, so that's all the, the responses we got. Um, so thank you everybody who submitted our, uh, that was our last social media question. Our next social media question is, does your character have any living family? If so, what family members do they have and how, if at all, have they come into play? Mm. So because this is Thanksgiving and I know a lot of us are missing <laughs> our families, I figured let's see if your characters are missing their family, <laughs> I guess. Because <laughs> it's so it's so common for players to be like, nope, I'm an orphan. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, a, I'm an orphan. I'm a ranger. Uh, I get plus two to attacks against the things that killed my parents. Yeah. like <laughs> There you go. Yeah. Um, this, again, reminds me of my character from Age of Worms. Uh, yep. Elijah had a, uh, his father was like a was like a re- tailor like a, or that? something. He he had he had a uh, uh cl- he ran a clothing business. Or so, yeah, or so he like he was like he was like the head of a of a business or something like that. So like he was he was just he was like a, like oh was like it an a, armor business? I think so because he I was think, an, okay he was an armorer. Sorry for some reason in my head I was like oh he was a tailor. I think I think he owned like he owned like a mining company that used that like use the metal to make armor or something like that yeah I don't know, something, but in any way he was like he was like my character was like the the kid who ran away from his rich family you know yeah. he's like i didn't want to i didn't he didn't want to but he was still kind of snooty so he, <laughs> he like he didn't want to live with his his family anymore because he didn't want to live off of their you know their coattails or whatever but yeah he was still kind of snooty about it anyway like you know, we we had him bump into his father at some point, and then like, and he actually fought his father and like got a scar from it or something. Yeah, he had like a scar on his arm. Yeah, and then later on, like the the like the dad showed up and like was like helping them against the you know the the main evil threat or something. So yeah, so they, yeah, like, that's, that's pretty cool. It's like they didn't like fully make up, but it was very much just like a like all right, at least we're on the same side on this, you know. <laughs> oh, like, so this is what you've been up to, <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, so yeah, that, yeah. that was kind of fun. Oh, cool. Um, and I mean, I, I haven't, I haven't actually played as a character in a while. Uh, last character I played was in your game as the, um, as uh, I, I was Captain Winter, and he did not have any family. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> he was, he was an orphan. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll say that when I played as my character Ichi, I did have in his backstory that he ran away from from uh, uh, his parents when he was a kid, and. When I was in high school, I wrote a I wrote a character backstory for him as a as a creative writing assignment, and then I wrote a just a story about just a story about him, not just a backstory, but like an actual story for another high school assignment. And in that, 
he tracked down and found his family and he was going to like they were you know by that point they were he was he was grown and and everything so they were already old and whatever and he was going he found out that they were indentured servants and he was going to try and free them but eventually decided that like they're changing up because of how old they were like changing up their lives as much as you know freeing them and then making them rely on themselves for for survival wouldn't have helped them necessarily so he just made sure that they were well taken care of uh, mm. where they were so mm. so yeah didn't actually come into play in the campaign but i took it upon myself to yeah to write some stuff about it sure yeah for sure so yeah um get those in on uh, on social media let us know listeners what you uh what you got going on i think it's definitely a part of the game that a lot of players don't ever engage in because they assume rightfully so the dm is just going to use it against them <laughs> right of course <laughs> yeah uh, so that'll do it for our questions for today. Before we close out, though, we uh, let's let's wind down a little bit. Let's let's relax. Let's take a deep breath. <sighs> let's remember those who have come before us, who have sacrificed their lives that we may have a better world to live in as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. Today's funeral pyre was submitted by Life's a Pity on Reddit, and this uh, a few episodes ago we had a story from this this person. They had a character who had a heart attack after carrying the party for fourteen levels, <laughs> um, and this was a reply to that. They said another great death from that same campaign was the paladin falling over a mile to his death while trying to leap from one airship to another. Oh dang. The airship they were on has had its mast and levitation crystal destroyed when another airship rammed them. So the entire party started to leap onto the other ship to commandeer it for themselves. The paladin rolled a natural one on the athletics check to jump between ships, so he didn't make the distance, then rolled another natural one while trying to grab the rigging that was hanging between the entangled ships. Oh, no. So that uh, two natural ones in a row, there isn't really much you can do to come back from that. <laughs> so... Um, I guess uh, let's raise a glass in memory of this uh, this paladin, as we say, Clay. <laughs> clink. I was trying. To, I was trying to. It's like he was falling while he was clink. Right. No, I, I guess is, is what I was going for. So. <laughs> All right, that'll do it for today. Thank you, everybody, for submitting. Uh, if you would like to submit questions for us to discuss, items for the Dragon's Horde, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned on the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. Join the discussion on social media. We are on Facebook. We are on Reddit. We are on our Interparty Discord. We're on Twitter at InPartyConflict. Check those out for our weekly social media questions. Your answers might end up on the show. Find us on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you'd like to support the show, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We have a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is a YouTube channel where you can watch us play video games, or you can join me on my Twitch channel over at twitch.tv slash tiltedtortle, and you can... Uh, yes. Come hang out with me as I play video games on there. Yeah, there you go. You've got some uh, some fun stuff on there. So yep. yeah, check that out. Also, head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show. What you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time. <coughs> oh, sorry, my podcast allergies. <laughs>